I never thought I'd be a patient. I was always an advocate. I was very busy with my life, enjoying my life. Spending time with my kids. I've always been an athlete. Uh, I've always been uh, drawn to the tennis court in particular. The first time I found out that I had HIV. The rheumatoid arthritis. Common variable immunodeficiency. First time I found out that I had breast cancer. Uh, it was like my world screeched to a halt. I felt really isolated. The first time I learned I had lymphoma, I was in shock. I couldn't believe that that would happen to me. I thought I had a stomach ache. I didn't have the energy to keep up with my kids. I was devastated. I couldn't sleep. I was terrified I was going to die any day. The lymphoma changed my life, and it changed the life of my family. It just changed everything. Everyday activities, going to work, seeing friends. I couldn't hold a tennis racket and I couldn't even hold a toothbrush. The hardest part for me was telling my eight-year-old daughter. My mom. My dad. My kids. The hardest part was telling my mother. She's 97 years old. She was terrified that I would die while she was still alive. I'm alive because of a combination of things. My family, my friends. I've had an incredible network of support. Because of all the medical breakthroughs, I'm able to live my life with great freedom. Medical technology, my surgery, and the chemotherapy. Thanks to the medication that I'm on and monitoring my health, I'm able to plan for the future. I owe my life to the drug that I was put on. It has worked for seven years, and that's very unusual for someone with my disease. Because of advanced medical treatments, I'm not defined by my illness. I'm able to do the things that I've, I want to do. I'm able to play tennis. I'm able to take long walks. To celebrate good times with friends and family, and I get to chase around my three-year-old. And just be grateful for the little things that happen every day. My name is John, and I have rheumatoid arthritis. My name is Julio Fonseca, and I am a person living with HIV. My name is Kathy Stokes, and I'm a breast cancer survivor. My name is Susan Parkinson, and I'm a survivor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chairman of the Board of Directors, Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, Robert J. Hugan. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Wow, what, what a way to start the 56th annual meeting for Pharma. Welcome and thank you so much for coming. We're very fortunate today. We're actually joined by three of the men and women who were on that, in that video. We have with us Craig Lustig, if you'd stand up. We also have Susan Parkinson and C.J. Corneliuson James. So, We are so fortunate that you are with us today, but we are here because of you. You are the reason why we are here. Make no mistake about it. And make no mistake about the fact that our commitment to make a difference in the lives of people who are underserved today is what develops and, and discovers for us our individual purpose and gives our companies mission and meaning. And it's our commitment to make a meaningful difference in the lives of patients all around the world that aligns us with all the stakeholders in the entire ecosystem of healthcare that's committed to making a difference in patients' lives every day. And it's my commitment to you that throughout this meeting, the patient will be at the center of all of the discussions that we have. So thank you again for being with us. I think it's very clear to all of us, certainly clear to me, why we are here. And the video certainly illustrated that. But where we are is also important. And I don't mean the Mayflower Hotel, but um, in Washington, D.C. It's no accident that we're in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is the home for policy makers, for government leaders, for advocacy groups, for the FDA, for the NIH, all important groups that tremendously influence 
the environment that we operate in. And if we are committed to creating the kind of positive environment that encourages progressive policies, that incentivize risk-taking so that we will discover and develop the next breakthrough therapies and reward innovation and ensure that patients have access to innovative therapies, we must be here and we must be engaged with all these constituencies to find those common interests to create that positive environment. And that's the mission that we have at the 56th Annual Pharma Meeting today, tomorrow, and Friday morning. When we, when we thought about what we were going to do for this meeting, we, had, we were thinking, what kind of theme should we have? What should the purpose be? And when you think about the environment that we operate in, it's extremely complex. There are very divergent trends in the things that we do. And we, and, we saw, and we saw that in every way we looked at thinking about what should we focus on at this meeting. You read the newspaper or you watch television, and it's very easy to come to the conclusion that these are probably the most challenging times in health care in America that there have ever, ever been. You hear about all the problems with the exchanges. You think about the cost of, of care and changes in the revolution that's happening in healthcare all over America. You can't pick up a newspaper and not read something that says there's great challenges here in healthcare. And, and when you really think about it as people that are as engaged as we are in it, these newspapers and the media that talks about the terrible problems that are real, they don't even really sense the shadow, the looming specter that's out there of this coming tsunami of costs for the care of an aging population with increasing rates of metabolic disease and cancer, Alzheimer's, that have the real potential to destabilize economic developed economies all over the world. This is a problem we don't even talk about that much in the press, and yet we th think about healthcare and the tremendous challenges we have. So it is a very, very difficult time in the area that we operate. But at the same time, if you go to the As humanity strived for a better tomorrow, pioneering innovations in science and breakthroughs in medicine, we began laying the groundwork that proved to enhance our lives and ultimately alter the course of mankind. By blazing new trails, we not only saved lives, we extended them. Over the last 100 years, life expectancy has now more than doubled. As we sought to learn more about ourselves, we saw glimpses of the promises to come. We learned to identify risks and seek preventative methods. And when new threats emerged, we met them with resilience and veracity. while advances in technology have dramatically accelerated the rate of discoveries. Today, with 5,400 medicines in development globally, we're doing more than ever to help people live longer, healthier lives. As we continue to build on the promises of today and ensure a brighter tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Vice President, Scientific and Regulatory Affairs, Dr. William Chin. Good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the afternoon. Great ideas change our world, and no, nowhere is that more true than in biomedical sciences. The biopharmaceutical research industry and the extended biomedical ecosystem exists, indeed thrives because of small and large ideas that change everything we thought we knew. And over, these time, over this time, these ideas lead to new innovative solutions 
to prevent or treat disease, and ultimately to improve the lives of patients. And as Bob has indicated, we're all about patients. Today, we're privileged to welcome Craig Mello, a science, scientist of profound ideas and accomplishments. So, uh, uh, J John and Reed, you're not the, uh, the only people who have a market on profundity. That's a, a joke. <laughs> Dr. Mello and uh, his colleague, Andrew Fire, received the 2006 Nobel Prize for Medicine or Physiology for their revolutionary work on how a fundamental mechanism uh, is involved in controlling the flow information within a cell. So they identified small bits of, of, of uh, material inside the cell called RNA. In fact, it's called RNAi, which can lead to uh, control of genetic flow of information. And so they learned how these, these controls uh, can uh, allow us to understand how these, these bits of DNA can cause or contribute to disease. They did this work in the 1990s. In fact, I believe, uh, Craig, your seminal work was published uh, in 1998, if not, not here. So think about the time between 19, to 1998 and 2006. That's only eight years. It's a little bit shorter than, than the time it takes for us to make medicines, actually, isn't it? But in that time, uh, it revolutionized how we think about genetic control of information. So according to uh, Dr. Nicholas Hasty, director of the MRC, this is the Medical Research Council in England, Human Genetic Unit, it is very unusual, he said, for a piece of work to completely revolutionize the way we think about biological processes and regulation, but this has opened up a whole new field in biology. Dr. Mello received his bachelor's degree in science from Brown, he did his graduate work at the University of Colorado, ultimately receiving his PhD in a minor uh, institution in Boston and Cambridge called Harvard. He currently, that's another joke. You guys, <laughs> come on. He's currently a distinguished professor uh, at the University of Massachusetts Medical School where he did all of his pioneering research and an investigator in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Dr. Mello is also involved in translating his work too. And so one message is the importance of basic science, but the importance of the ability to move those ideas to life so that our patients can benefit a lot from that. And in fact, one of your ventures is positioned possibly to be one of the first companies to have FDA approval for an RNA, RNAi therapy. So uh, I, I know I occasionally have a chance to say this, uh, but I really mean this. Uh, it's truly an honor and a privilege to introduce uh, you, uh, Craig, Dr. Craig Mello, and, and he'll talk to us about looking forward where we are taking medical science. Craig? Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and, and thanks for warming up the crowd. I hope they laugh at my jokes a little harder. <laughs> I, when I, I came in, I got in line to uh, sign up for the Convention of Colonial Dames. I, I thought <laughs> I actually uh, was in line for a minute before I realized that that wasn't uh, the pharma group. But anyway, it's great to be here. And um, I, really, the, the part of the theme of my talk is absolutely in line with what Bob was saying earlier. Things in biomedical research right now have never, never been more exciting. We are unlocking the secrets of life right now all over the world. And you know, it, it's in large part due to the, the genome sequencing you're all familiar with, but also amazing new tools for probing that sequence information, discovering how genes function, and of course, what genes contribute to disease? So we're really at a fundamental uh, watershed in uh, understanding human health at the level of the gene. And uh, the epigene, epigenetics is another thing. It's fascinating, and I'm gonna try to convey some of that excitement and enthusiasm for what's coming. 
Um, and the first slide I'm going to show you actually shows, a, it has a soundtrack because I can't put words to how, how wonderful, exciting things are. It's going to show little embryos developing from the nematode C. elegans. They have little green fluorescent protein decorating the boundaries between their cells. And I'll let this speak for itself. It's called Children of Tomorrow. So uh, those are worm embryos, and uh, they have a lot to teach us still about ourselves. Andrew Fire and I did our work on RNA interference studying that little tiny organism. Uh, I'll introduce it a little bit more in a moment. This, this slide here shows the ovary of a nematode. And our germline and this germline, as it says right there, journeyed together on this not always sunny little planet for over three billion years, okay? And, our, um, and so there's a lot of things going on in that ovary that happen in the human ovary. One of the things, in, you know, I showed this to my mom, and you see those little red granules that are there in the cytoplasm, these little balls that are moving? Those, she, she just took, she's an artist. She took one look at that. She said, Craig, work on those things. Those are gonna be important. <laughs> and she was, you know, this was before we discovered anything that I'll tell you about today, but she's absolutely right. Um, there's a huge amount of information flowing into the eggs that are forming on the bottom. The dark circles you see are the nuclei. That's where the genetic DNA information is, but the cytoplasm is full of information. The green stuff, that's mitochondria. Those are little, like bacteria, that were captured by a primitive eukaryote uh, billions of years ago, and their genetic information is there inside those little green things. They're like little bacterial endosymbionts, they're called. They help us out. They help us make energy now. Um, the red things are full of RNA and protein, and I'll tell you, that's where there's a whole bunch of RNA inter interference information, which is like the IT center of the cell. It's like the tech center of the cell. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we're figuring out how that stuff works to control the flow of information from one generation to the next, and how these kinds of same mechanisms function to make all of your cells do different things. Why is your neuron so different from your skin? It's got the same DNA, but it's programmed differently. So it all starts with the history of life. And one of the things as a scientist growing up, people were walking on the moon and I thought, oh man, I want to be an astronaut. I want to go to a, somewhere out there, find new living things and study them. And then I realized how far away everything was, and that probably wasn't going to happen for me. Uh, but then I realized, hey, I'm on a planet right now. What about this stuff? How does it work? So I really got excited about understanding biology, partly because my dad was a paleontologist here at the Smithsonian, but also I read uh, in, the, in the Washington Post growing up as a kid that people had cloned the human insulin gene and that bacteria could read the human genetic code and make insulin, and this could save people's lives. And I thought, wow, that is really powerful stuff. I wanna be a biologist. So anyway, 
But here, it all begins here. Why can bacteria read the human genetic code? And this uh, slide here is showing you what I said earlier. This planet has not always been quite so sunny. If you look at the history of the Earth, there are actually events where the ice spread all the way down to the equator. It's called a snowball Earth event. This is from the cover of Nature magazine. There's a few arrows on the slide pointing out some landmarks in the history of life. You're looking at the Cambrian explosion right there, which occurred right after the last snowball event. Not coincidentally, I think, because uh, that was the first time the Earth really opened up for the diversification of life. First land plants and stuff started flourishing then. Um, but RNA interference, what Andy Fire and I work on, was already present in the common ancestor of not only worms in humans, but of plants and even bacteria in humans. It's a really, really ancient mechanism involved in the control of the flow of information. And I just want to put this in perspective with the next slide, which takes you down to the history of the Earth formation four and a half billion years ago. And what you can see here is something truly, truly remarkable. Now the Cambrian explosion is way up near the top, and you probably think that's a long time ago. But compared to the origin of life on the planet, that's really pretty recent history. So the first cells about 3.8 billion years uh, ago, according to the fossil record. And then there's, you know, and that's really pretty remarkable because only 700 million years after the Earth cools, you have the first fossil evidence of cells. And a lot of sophisticated things had to happen. Around two billion years ago, you have the, this thing you can see there called the oxygen catastrophe. You can't make this stuff up. Little, little organism, cyanobacteria, figured out how to split water, grab electrons from water, and release oxygen into the atmosphere during the process of something called photosynthesis, a remarkably sophisticated mechanism evolved right about that time, and in the fossil record at that time, you see the longest snowball event ever, 100 million years of ice on the planet. They almost wiped out everything. Imagine that, an organism messing with the climate of the whole planet and almost ruining it for everybody. Um, but but it, it's interesting, too, because they, without oxygen, you can't get big. So the big animals had to wait for oxygen levels to get high enough. And you can see that that doesn't happen until much later. Really, at the base of the Cambrian, you have this explosion in larger animals that begin to occupy the planet. You have the flourishing of land plants and animals. And that's, if you look at it on the year, if you put this time scale on the scale of a year, the Cambrian explosion is November 18th. I think that's what it says there. It's just, you know, last month. And the dinosaur extinction is right there. And yet people are thinking, well, it's an animal. We can't, you know, why should we study a worm? You know, well, a worm and us shared all of this ancestry. The mechanisms that are at work in the worm and even a plant can tell us a lot about us. And as you'll see later, bacteria. They're also incredibly sophisticated and they have a lot to teach us. So that's why I'm here, because uh, what scientists do, uh, even working on these very simple model organisms, can break open new territory and, um, and expand the, the horizons for all scientists, including uh, people in the pharmaceutical interest, industry. Now, I know this is uh, an audience that's not all PhD scientists, so the next couple of slides are gonna bring everybody up to speed on everything you need to know to understand uh, what I'm gonna tell you about, okay? So this one just tells you what RNA is, and it's from Nova Science Every Now. Every creature, and you know this from high school, oh, is made from a recipe that comes from its DNA, spelled out in chemicals, A's and C's and T's and G's, inside the famous double helix. Every creature has its own DNA, different from mice, and then for whales, and for flowers, but to go from a chemical recipe, A's, G's, and T's, to a real creature that squeaks, or soars through the air, or turns gloriously pink, that requires RNA. RNA is the thing that turns you from a chemical code to a real 
pulsing, living creature. RNA builds life. That's big. So I, w I once had a reporter ask me, you know, my, my uh, listeners don't know what RNA is. Can I just say protein? So I had to, I had to say, no, RNA is important. Your, your listeners have to learn what RNA is. RNA is the message, really, that, trans that takes uh, information from the nucleus out to the cytoplasm and can help you express your genes. But, but as you'll see in my talk, RNA can also regulate DNA. And it can even direct the cleavage of the DNA. So RNA is big. It's really big. It's actually the most important molecule in the cell. Well, I can say that. But anyway, this movie will just sort of take you inside the cell to give you a primer on everything that you need to know in terms of the way cells work. That's the DNA all coiled up inside the, the nucleus of the cell. And when your DNA needs to express a gene, it's going to make what's called a messenger RNA, and that's the RNA polymerase there, the big green blob that's jumped on, and it's incorporating the nucleotides that are ribose nucleotides instead of deoxyribose, just a minor difference. It's very chemically similar to DNA. It's a long polymer that contains the genetic information needed, in this case, to make a protein, because it's an MR, a messenger RNA. So it comes out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm where it's going to encounter ribosomes, which can translate the genetic information, three, codon, three nucleotides at a time. They read that code, and they incorporate the amino acids to make all the proteins that make up our body. Now, this is RNA interference. You see a, 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 a Zandi probably injecting RNA, and that's gets, this RNA gets processed, this is during RNA interference, into small pieces that get loaded onto a searching protein called an argonaut, and, I'll, and that's that blue blob that's got some little ears on it. And it goes out and it uses the sequence information in the short piece of RNA to find matching, perfectly matching information, and then it cleaves it. So it's an enzyme that can not only search and find information, but it can destroy it. So this is what we discovered called RNA interference. I'll just tell you a little bit more about it in my talk. And we discovered it in this worm, C. elegans, which is, uh, again, um, a really elegant uh, little model organism for studying um, all kinds of things. And it's already, this little guy has already won five Nobel Prize medals, um, one in chemistry and uh, four in medicine, um, and, and still has a lot to teach us. Uh, and, and it's only about a millimeter long, so it's a tiny, tiny little animal. Um, and it's very useful for a whole variety of reasons. First of all, like I said earlier, it shares many of the same mechanisms that we do. It has muscles very similar to ours. It has, you know, germline, that's the cells I showed you that make the, o the eggs and the sperm. It has a nervous system. It has behaviors. It can even remember stuff, believe it or not. Um, and, uh, and also, they're completely transparent. So you can see everything that's happening inside them. In that picture, you're actually able to see uh, the eggs lined up along one side of the animal. So, and, and all of this in an animal that produces 300 progeny in three days. So, uh, and you can feed it bacteria. So it's a great model organism, still has a lot to teach us. And that's where we discovered RNAi. So I, I showed you a little outline of how that RNAi mechanism works. And one of the, the key players in that pathway was this blue blob that was holding onto a short piece of RNA and using that RNA as a guide. And that's what you see here uh, in this crystal structure and what this uh, protein is, is the Google of the cell. This is really exactly what it is. Cells, and I didn't say this during the little movie, but the movie had slowed everything down so you could see what was happening. That, that green blob, the polymerase, that thing actually incorporates nucleotides into mRNA.